Welcome to Michael Potts F1, everything Formula One, but from a photographer's point of view. Round 13, Hungary, the driver's market. Before we get into the photography, I'd like to catch you up on all the latest in the driver's market. On Thursday, we had the bombshell news that four times world champion Sebastian Vettel will be retiring at the end of the season. It's fair to say that the two years he spent at Aston Martin haven't gone completely to plan. He joined a team that was in its ascendancy towards the end of 2000. They'd won a race, they'd got pole position, and it looked like a team that was on the up. Since rebranding themselves as Aston Martin, things haven't gone well. They're in that transition period from being a small team that punches above its ability to being a larger team that will hopefully one day be a title contender. Unfortunately, that's meant that the last two years have been a bit of a struggle. So instead of fighting for wins and podiums and pole positions, Seb spent most of his time battling to try and get into Q2 and, and scrapping for 10th place. This is not where he wants to be. And I can understand why he doesn't have the energy to commit to a full season next year. 24 races is very grueling. Aston Martin definitely wanted to keep him. And this is a choice that he's made entirely on his own. Throughout the weekend, there was a lot of speculation about who would take his place. Mick Schumacher's name had been mentioned along with a few other drivers. However, no one I spoke to predicted what would happen next. On Monday after the race, Fernando Alonso announced that he'd be moving from Alpine to Aston Martin. This was completely left field. It took everyone by surprise, including Alpine, who only found out about this in the Aston Martin press release. All the noises during the course of the weekend were that Fernando was about to re-sign with Alpine. All he had to do was cross the T's and dot the I's. However, it appears that he wasn't particularly happy with the one-year contract extension they were offering. From what I understand, they'd offered him a one-year contract with the option for a second year if Alpine chose to renew it. He was after a two-year deal, so this didn't match his expectation. I think that offer hurt him a little bit. When the seat became available at Aston Martin, he must have moved very quickly to secure that drive. This is actually the third time he's leaving Alpine slash Renault. And each time he's left them in a very bad position. At some point, they're gonna realize that he's probably not the best driver for them. Moving to a team that's further back than the team that you're currently in is always a bit risky in Formula One. However, Aston Martin has a lot of money and a lot of ambition. So presumably, that's what's attracted him. His career has been littered with bad choices. Hopefully, this is not another one of those. For Aston Martin, they get a world champion with a huge reputation, but he's in the twilight of his career. Would they have been better served by getting a younger, hungrier driver without the name recognition? Are they getting a reputation for being a retirement fund for aging champions? Fernando Alonso is a fiery, outspoken driver. And Lawrence Stroll? He's a hard, no compromising team boss. What's going to happen when the two clash, when things get tough? So, where do all these moves leave Alpine? Alpine have the mega, star in the making, Oscar Piastri, the Australian driver, as their reserve. They've supported him through the junior programs, letting him win Formula 2 and Formula 3, reportedly at the cost of around $6 million. This puts him in the same category as George Russell and Charles Leclerc, drivers who've won those series at their first attempt. Oscar is exceptionally quick. This year, he's been working as a team's development driver. He's been going to all of the races. He's been getting involved wherever he can. He's got a huge hunger and amazing work ethic. So it's only natural that Alpine should announce him as a replacement for Fernando Alonso. Only, just after they announced him, he sent out a statement of his own. It reads, I understand that without my permission, Alpine F1 put out a press release late this afternoon that I would be driving for them this year. That is wrong, and I have not signed a contract with Alpine for 2023. I will not be driving for Alpine next year. That bombshell nearly broke F1 Twitter. To walk out of a team that supported you for years, that's invested millions in your career, and is now offering you the drive that you crave, it's huge. And to do it in such a public manner, it's going to be interesting to find out where the relationship broke down. But this is a young man with the potential of being a world champion. And he wants to get on with it as soon as possible. The rumour is that he's going to go to McLaren. This means that McLaren will have to buy Daniel Ricciardo out of his contract. In case anyone doubted it, Oscar Piastri has just shown he's got a lot of guts. This is why the driver market is called the silly season. It's time to grab your popcorn, sit back and watch the drama unfold. The Hungara Ring. The Hungara Ring is located just outside Budapest. It's been on the calendar for many years. Friday was scorching. Temperatures got up to 33 degrees Celsius, 91 Fahrenheit. I was in the pits for the first session, and it feels like an oven in there as everything is concrete. I managed to get this shot of the underside of Max Verstappen's Red Bull. Here you can see the little winglets directing air underneath the car. This year the cars are using ground effect. Basically the aerodynamics suck the car down onto the track. 
These winglets direct the air underneath the car, creating a Venturi effect. You also see a small number one. This is quite an interesting effect because the wing should cover that and normally no one should see it, but it's quite nice that it's there. In the afternoon, I was out on track, the bright sunlight creating some very dramatic scenes. The sun was a little bit low, creating a nice warm light. There are a number of iconic shots around the track, such as this shot with the water tower in the background. As the track is located some distance outside Budapest, you can also get a shot of cars with trees in the background. This often makes an interesting shot as the darkness of the trees can often contrast with the lightness of some of the cars. On Saturday, there was an almighty storm during the first free practice session. I waited for as long as possible before going out, but one of the other photographers I know got caught in the downpour. He had to shelter in a port loo for about 20 minutes. The rain eased up just before the start of the session and the cars were able to take to the track on time. This is a shot of Charles de Klerk having a bit of a wobble coming out of turn four. The wheels pointing in a different direction to the car. He managed to catch it before it went into a spin, but it just shows how hazardous things are in the wet. There was a fair bit of standing water on the track and the cars threw up these massive rooster tails as they sped through the forest. I feel because of the aerodynamic changes, the spray coming from the back of the car is much more exaggerated than on previous years. Qualifying was mostly dry, but the clouds looked ominous. Very dark, foreboding. Here I'm shooting through the barrier. This lets me get down as low as possible. The tunnel. One of the unique things about the Hungar Ring is there's this tunnel between the car parks and the garages. Most of the teams and drivers walk through this to get to the paddock. It's an interesting space with dramatic lights and it can create some very, very cool photographs. Here is a photograph of Lewis wearing another cracking outfit, but you can see that the high contrast creates quite a cool image. The, the tunnel's a great place to photograph. Not only is it very cool on Friday, but it was also dry on Saturday. If you look down the tunnel, you'll see that the race organizer has printed all of the names of the previous winners. All the previous winners, except for Esteban Ocon, last year's winner. Esteban took things into his own hands and wrote his name on the wall of champions. Not to be outdone, Lando Norris decided to write his name as well. Here's a picture of him being caught in the act. It would have been quite a cool story if he had gone on to win this race. When I asked Esteban about this, he just smiled and said, well, he hasn't won yet, has he? The Paddock. Fewer celebrities attended this race, but we did have Ferdinand, Zodomir, Maria, Balthaus, Keith, Michael, Otto, Antal, Bernham, Leonard, Van Habsburg, Lorraine. The heir apparent to the house of Habsburg, Lorraine, the former Austrian royal family. He's a racer in his own right with an LMP2 Le Mans 24 hour win. He nearly won Macau, but had a dramatic crash on the last lap. I do get this photograph of Fernando with his girlfriend, Andrea. He looks remarkably relaxed, so presumably the deal with Aston has already gone through. She's a journalist working for Severus TV, and I wonder at what point she found out that this was happening. And I wonder at what point she reported on it. Here's Lana Norris with his girlfriend, Lucina. The Portuguese model had just jetted in from Greece, where she'd been holidaying with some friends. The local delicacy in the paddock this weekend were these amazing Hungarian horn-shaped pastries. They're made from a sweet yeast dough that's wrapped around these damp wooden rolls and then cooked over an open charcoal fire. They're absolutely delicious and definitely worth trying if you're in the region. Mercedes. Another nice thing about this track is that we have access to the roof above the Mercedes pits. I was able to get the shot of Lewis leaving his garage on the way to Q3 qualifying. It's very rare that we get this access because most tracks sell the space to VIPs. I love overhead shots of Formula One cars. It's an unusual angle and it makes a very interesting photograph. The grid. I did manage to get this photograph looking down on the top of Sebastian Vettel's helmet. I'm using a Nikon 8 to 15 millimeter fisheye lens. It's a lovely lens and it gives you a completely different perspective. Seb has a custom helmet for this weekend, showing Lego blocks and the words, let the children play. Throughout his career, Sebastian's had some amazing one-off helmets and I'm really gonna miss his creativity next year. George Russell. Mr. Saturday got his first pole position. George Russell has a reputation of being very fast over one lap. When he was with Williams, he managed to get that car up the grid where it didn't belong. In both his Formula 2 and Formula 3 championship winning seasons, he got more pole positions than any of his rivals. The guy is seriously quick at qualifying. Doing that this year, when Mercedes is probably the third fastest car, is incredible. Yes, I know he was helped by some mechanical issues to his rivals, but it's still a very, very good result. His race started off really well. He led from the start. I was expecting the Ferraris to overtake him sooner, so he held on to that lead for a very long time. He did struggle to get the tyres warm after his final pit stop, and Lewis managed to overtake him for second place. Still, he managed to finish third. This is another strong result for Mercedes, and now they're only 30 points behind Ferrari. George is fourth in the championship. He's ahead of Carlos Sainz. From where they were at the start of the year, this is an incredible turnaround. Charles Leclerc. This was a race that Charles really needed to close the gap to Max. He's starting quite far behind the Red Bull driver because of his crash in the French Grand Prix last weekend. 
And with Max starting seven places behind him, this is an ideal opportunity for him to claw back some of those points. Only Ferrari's managed to find yet another way to lose a race. They had the fastest car this weekend. They had a weekend without any mechanical issues. The drivers didn't crash, but they contrived to lose the race on tyre strategy. They actually started the race quite well. Around about halfway, Charles is leading and he's got the fastest lap. However, he comes in for a pit stop and moves onto the hard tyres. The hard tyres have been very, very hard to warm up throughout the course of the weekend. And because of the colder conditions on Sunday, most teams opted not to use it because they knew it was going to be so much slower. The tyre is harder. This gives it greater longevity, but it's harder to heat up, which means it's slower. Because Charles was struggling on the hard tyre, they decided to bring him in for yet another pit stop. This put him way down the field and didn't give him enough time to be able to make those positions back before the end of the race. I doubt they really needed that stop and it probably would have been better for him to stay out on the hards. This race was a golden opportunity for Ferrari to close the gap on Red Bull. But we leave the Hungaroring with the gap being even bigger. This is not what Ferrari needs. I think the whole Ferrari team is running under a level of pressure that they're just not used to. Mercedes and Red Bull had such an intense battle last year that both teams have become used to operating at this level. Ferrari haven't had this for a number of years and you can see that they're taking risks that just aren't paying off. The drivers are driving the cars over the limit and the teams are really pushing the engines beyond their capability and they're making these risky strategy calls that just aren't paying off. The gap is so big now that the season is probably lost for them but they do need to regroup over the summer break, come back and try and win the second half of the year. They need the second half to create belief, build momentum and show that they can win at this level and that they'll be contenders for 2023. Max Verstappen. Tenth to first. This is one of the greatest drives I've seen by Max Verstappen. This is right up there with Hockenheim in 2019, where in changeable conditions he also spun but won the race. What made this special was all of the obstacles he had to overcome to achieve the win. Personally, I thought third place would be the most that he could get out of this weekend. I was expecting both Ferraris to finish ahead of him, possibly George or Lewis as well. On Saturday during qualifying, his engine failed. They had to replace the entire unit. This left him down in 10th place on the grid on a track that's notoriously difficult to overtake. While it's really bad luck that his engine failed, he was quite lucky that it failed on Saturday and not on Sunday. Had it lasted for another, say, two or three laps, he would have started the race with this and would not have been able to finish. On his way to the grid, he realized that the tires that he had planned to start the race on, the hard tires, were not gonna perform well in these cold conditions. So the team made a split decision to move to the more aggressive, but less durable soft tires. This allowed him to be more aggressive at the start and complete a lot of overtakes in the first part of the race. You can see why this is such a critical decision when you look at Charles Leclerc's pace on the hard tires later in the race. Shortly after Max first overtook Charles, he spun because of a throttle issue. This allowed Charles to come back and overtake him. There was some very clever teamwork by Perez, which prevented Max losing another place to George Russell. Even though he spun, he didn't manage that spin very well. The tires weren't too damaged. He didn't damage the car anyway. And very soon he was back overtaking Leclerc. Max is showing how well he can deal with adversity, how calm he can be when things go wrong, and how quickly he and Red Bull can react to new strategies and changing conditions. They're a team where both drivers are working so well together. On a race weekend where the Red Bull was slower than both Mercedes and Ferrari, where Max had these mechanical issues that made him start from 10th on the grid to spinning mid-race, he goes on to win the race by seven seconds. That's mega. Like, how do you stop that? There are going to be a few team principals asking themselves that question repeatedly over the summer break. Thank you for watching my review of the 2022 Hungarian Grand Prix. Formula One is going into its summer break. There won't be any racing for the next three weeks. But don't worry, there'll be a vlog out at the same time next week. Until then, goodbye.